My name is Doug Tilden. I'm a longtime member of the Steamship Historical Society, as well as a former Vice President of the United States Lines. This YouTube video accompanies the second in a series of articles to appear in the Steamship Historical Society's magazine, Power Ships, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the founding of the United States Lines. This video and the accompanying article addresses the larger-than-life personalities that surrounded the early years of United States Lines. Despite the fact that for the first 10 years of its existence, U.S. Lines was an unprofitable, government-run company, it certainly attracted its share of period luminaries. The previous article in this series was published in Powerships 317 in April 2021. In it, I recounted the circumstances surrounding the founding and the first decade of operations of United States Lines under government stewardship. The company was forged in the market chaos of post-World War I American shipping, where a large fleet of war surplus vessels dashed any hopes of profitable operations for U.S. shipping companies. Congressional restrictions on foreign sales of war surplus vessels resulted in the U.S. government becoming the reluctant operator of both passenger and cargo ships through the United States Shipping Board. While United States Lines was specifically created by the board to operate a fleet of seized German passenger liners, its founding story was not without many larger-than-life characters from the private sector. I will attempt to tell some of their stories in this article, particularly as they relate to United States Lines. The first half of the 20th century was a very different time in America. The last half of the 19th century had seen the rise of business tycoons and shipping magnets who affected all aspects of American life. These people, including all the people in this article, were the business rock stars of their day, their public personas rivaling those of current-day Elon Musk and Bill Gates. But today, how many of us could even name the chairperson of even one of the top five world shipping companies? In 1920s America, the stories of shipping people appeared not only on the pages of shipping gazettes and magazines, but also appeared on the pages of newspapers like the New York Times and the Baltimore Sun. Their business dealings, their social comings and goings, and even the vacations graced those pages. Here, the New York Times is reporting on P.A.S. Franklin, the chairman of the International Mercantile Marine, sailing for Europe on business. Similarly, Bruce Ismay, the infamous president of White Star Line at the time of the Titanic sinking, has his travel plans also reported in the time. Many of the people in this video had a profound influence not only on shipping, but on the shape of early 20th century America. We start our journey with J.P. Morgan. For the sake of brevity, I did not extensively cover Morgan in the magazine article. After all, he had died in 1913, eight years before the founding of U.S. lines. But it's hard to separate his creation, the International Mercantile Marine, from the U.S. line story. And in fact, the entire American merchant marine of the first half of the 20th century. The quest by IMM to operate the grandest of the post-war passenger line, liners, the Leviathan, had a lot to do with shaping the early years of U.S. lines. And as I recounted in the previous article, the IMM eventually took U.S. lines off the government's hands in 1931, and under the leadership of Morgan's successor, P.A.S. Franklin, and then Franklin's son, John, they built the U.S. lines into the largest U.S. flag carrier. In fact, U.S. lines itself has traced its lineage to the IMM. It is a bit of mar marketing hyperbole to show such a direct linkage between USL and IMM since the two companies were competitors in the first 10 years of U.S. Lines' existence. They were competitors not only for passengers and cargo, particularly on the transatlantic, but also for the affections of the grandest ship of the American fleet, the Leviathan. It would be hard to imagine early 20th century America without J.P. Morgan. Here he is leaving the White House, where he was a frequent visitor. He was born into the finance business and cut his teeth with a number of banking businesses controlled by his father. But he created new business lines for his financial company, 
by using his prowess and resources to establish trusts. His trust formula involved purchasing or merging businesses in the same industry to gain market domination. He was successful in this in several industries, including steel, creating the largest company of its time, U.S. Steel, insurance, electronics, and railroading. He had twice personally stepped in to stop runs on the stock market and the U.S. Treasury. He effectively was the nation's central banking system before the creation of the Federal Reserve. Morgan was reported to have had a physically dominating presence. But despite his stature, Morgan was a very shy person and self-conscious of his enlarged nose from rosacea. And here we see him about to cane an uncooperative cameraman. Morgan was also a humanitarian and a strong patron of the arts. He helped launch the New York Metropolitan Museum onto the world stage. In the early 1900s, shipping caught his attention. The idea of establishing a trust to try and gain market domination in shipping initially was not Morgan's. It was first raised by Clement Griscom, the founder of International Navigation Company. International Navigation controlled the American line and the Belgian-based Red Star Line. Griscom had aspirations, but he lacked the capital to pull off the acquisitions necessary to make the trust formula work. Griscom and Morgan had a commonality of interest through several railroads, most particularly the Pennsylvania Railroad, and Griscom took the idea of shipping trust to Morgan. A series of acquisitions resulted from their discussions and which culminated in 1902 with the launching of the International Mercantile Marine Company. Morgan increased the capitalization of the enterprise from international navigation's $15 million to $170 million of stock issued in IMM's name, as well as cash that he raised from his financial institutions. He took control of the shipping conglomerate himself and rewarded Griscom with a key management position. The event was not unnoticed in the press. The International Mercantile Marine ultimately controlled 11 companies. It was the largest U.S. flag operator of the World War I era and the largest operator of ships in the Atlantic with 133 ships at its peak under three flags, U.S., Belgian, and British. During much of the early years of the 1920s, the IMM controlled seven companies. Some of the most prominent companies were the Red Star Line. Red Star was the U.S. owned but Belgian flag company. Many of its ships were named with the suffix land and here we see its 1902 flagship at the time of the merger, the Finland, a very graceful transatlantic passenger liner. And then there was Atlantic Transport. Originally based in Baltimore, Atlantic Transport was a shipping company launched with the help of a railroad. In this case, the Baltimore and Ohio. Many of their ships had Native American or American city names, and here we see their Minneapolis in war colors. The American Line. The American Line was another of Griscom's companies, although its lineage went back before Griscom to 1871. Its house flag should be recognizable since it became the U.S. Line's house flag after the merger with IMM in 1931. This is their 1895 built St. Paul, another beautiful transatlantic liner. And last but not least, the White Star Line. It certainly shook the British establishment when White Star was bought, off, bought out by the Americans and Canard was quick, quick to fight, fight back. White Star matched their gambit by contracting for a trio of large ships which included the Titanic. The Titanic of course sunk on its maiden voyage and the announcement was made on the steps of the IMM headquarters at 17 Broadway in New York City. The number of companies in the International Mercantile Marine 
varied over time. And as I recounted in the first article, International Mercantile Marine took over U.S. lines from the U.S. government in 1931. It is historical conjecture as to what Morgan's real objective was with the International Mercantile Marine. Although shipping was booming in 1900 when Griscom first approached Morgan, the previous 20 years had seen 16 years of negative returns and only four years of profits for shipping. It's obviously possible that Morgan truly believed that the trust formula would stabilize the market and end the boom or bust, mostly bust, cycle of the industry. But it's equally likely that Morgan was also looking after his extensive railroad holdings. Morgan had interest in no less than 21 railroads, and those railroads and U.S. Steel were his biggest investments. The railroads and the shipping companies had a very close relationship in the early 20th century. It wasn't uncommon for both passengers and freight to be quoted through rates, door-to-door if you will, including the rail move and the port connections between railroads and shipping companies were all vital and often fought over. Cross-ownership and shared directorates between railroads and shipping companies were common. Cornerstone IMM companies like the American Line and Red Star Line, as well as Atlantic Transport, had originally been set up as extensions of railroads. When the IMM was established, its major competitor, the German Hamburg-American Line, didn't fear IMM competition. It feared that the IMM would cut off access to the American railroads controlled by Morgan. It's speculation, but clearly Morgan was feathering his railroad nest by controlling the shipping companies that fed the railroads freight and passengers. Period luminary is Kermit Roosevelt. No other person plays as consistent a role in the U.S. line story as does Kermit Roosevelt. Kermit was the son of President Teddy Roosevelt and came from a long line of ship owners on his mother's side. The Kermit family controlled the New York-based Red Star Line from 1835 to 1869. This Red Star, not to be confused with the more well-known Belgian-based company, which became part of the International Mercantile Marine in 1902. Ironically, Roosevelt would become an officer of Red Star in 1931. Kermit had an interesting upbringing. His father involved him in many of his adventures, including hobnobbing with royalty. Kermit is seen here with his father and the German Kaisers shortly before World War I. And here with Teddy's Smithsonian safari to Africa. However, Kermit is often viewed as an historically tragic figure. He never quite emerged from the considerable shadow of his father. He battled long-term issues with depression and alcoholism that precipitated family interventions, including from his cousin Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as well as from Winston Churchill. Kermit fought for both England and the U.S. in World War I. Here seen in what would become post-war Iraq fighting for the British. But in World War II, despairing of playing a meaningful role He took his own life in 1943 while stationed in Alaska. During the period covered by our story, however, the 1920s, Kermit was at his peak, leveraging his important business, political, and social connections. His circle of friends included the Astor families and the Kennedys. Vincent Astor, seen here, was the son of Astor patriarch John Jacob Astor IV, who ironically would die on the Titanic. Vincent was a close friend. Joseph Kennedy, another friend, was the Kennedy clan patriarch. Kennedy also had a shipping background, cutting his business and shipping teeth at the Four River Shipyard in Quincy, Massachusetts. Many of my relatives worked at Four River. In addition to being a close friend, Vincent Astor was a frequent financial supporter of Kermit's businesses. Here, he is buying IMM stock after Kermit joined the International Mercantile Marine. Roosevelt's major enterprise in the 1920s was Roosevelt's Steamship Company, which he founded in 1920 to operate services for the United States Shipping Board. The major services he operated included the American Indian Line, the Atlantic Australian Line, and the American Pioneer Line. 
He also briefly operated an around-the-world service with K-Line of Japan and served on the board of K-Line's longtime North American agent, Kerr Steamship. American Indian Line and Atlantic Australia Line disappeared fairly quickly in the 1920s. But the American Pioneer Line lived on and was merged with U.S. lines in the 1930s. Subsequently, the services that were branded American Pioneer Line were sold to Farrell Lines in the 1960s, but still the American Pioneer name lived on, on into the 1980s on ships like the Pioneer Commander. Kermit's contribution to the United States Line story really began in 1921. Many histories of United States Lines credit Kermit along with Averill Harriman of United American Line and Albert Moore of Moore McCormick Line as being the founders of United States Lines. It is my view expressed in the first article that this honor rightfully belongs to the chairman of the United States Shipping Board, Albert Lasker. In the mess that was created by the collapse of the United States Mail Steamship Company in 1921, the government, represented by Lasker, recruited Roosevelt, Harriman, and Moore to provide a commercial cover for what in reality was a 100% government-run company. The relationship between the United States Shipping Board and the other parties did not last long. Within two years, continuing losses made it obvious that the government was going to have to operate U.S. lines for a considerable length of time, and the arrangements with the three companies were terminated. Harriman and Moore went on to other enterprises. But Roosevelt stayed in shipping and stayed in the background of U.S. lines all throughout the 1920s. Press releases from the era frequently cite Roosevelt as an accompanying key U.S. lines executives at, at important company events. At the same time, Kermit was gro drawing closer to the International Mercantile Marine and leveraging his relationships with the United States Shipping Board. Here we see Roosevelt at the United States Shipping Board headquarters with manager E.C. Plummer. In the early 1930s, these activities came to a head as evidenced in these New York Times headlines when first Roosevelt and IMM merged together to form Roosevelt International Mercantile Marine. Roosevelt International Mercantile Marine, in turn, acquired the remaining stock of U.S. lines. The remaining International Mercantile Marine companies were then merged into United States lines, and United States lines was the surviving trade name by the mid-1930s. Kermit finally resigned his shipping posts in 1938 after 17 years of association with United States Lines and seven years of helping guide United States Lines as a board member. Our next influential person is Averill Harriman. Harriman had a long career in both business and government. He was the son of E.H. Harriman, the railroad tycoon who controlled both the Union Pacific and Southern Pacific Railroads. Harriman was born into advantage but made his own mark on America throughout the first half of the 20th century. In the world of politics, Harriman served as U.S. ambassador to both the Soviet Union during World War II and then the United Kingdom. He was also Secretary of Commerce under Truman and the Governor of New York. For our generation, his most prominent role was as Under Secretary of State under both the Kennedy and Johnson administrations. Harriman was one of the primary architects of U.S. involvement in Vietnam during that period. Prior to that, on the commercial side, Harriman's primary interest was in banking. And through his banking business, he invested, and in some cases controlled, many companies with a broad array of businesses. He did seem to have an attraction to shipping and freight, having major shares in three railroads and five shipping companies. In his early career, his shipping interest centered on United American Line. And it was through this company that he came to be associated with U.S. lines. United American Lines was totally controlled by Harriman and had been financed by his mother as his first major business enterprise. 
He was recruited in 1921 with Kermit Roosevelt and Albert Moore to be managing agent for the United States shipping board operation of United States lines. This role for Harriman lasted a shorter period of time than it did for either Roosevelt or McCormick. In 1922, Harriman purchased two ships from Royal Holland Lloyd, the Reliance seen here, and the Resolute for the transatlantic passenger trade. That put him directly in competition with the United States lines. Harriman then resigned as U.S. lines managing agent six months before the contracts with Roosevelt and Moore were terminated, as I uh, discussed previously. Harriman then joined a long list of suitors for the Leviathan, and in 1923 he unsuccessfully negotiated with the United States Shipping Board for his United American line to take over the Leviathan and three other ex-German liners. Ultimately, in the face of adverse market conditions, United American was absorbed by Hapag Lloyd in 1926. This is the Resolute, the sister ship of the Reliance, in Hapag colors in 1926, after he, Hapag had taken over United American. Because of his early role under Albert Lasker's guidance, Harriman is frequently credited as one of the founders of United States Lines. The two people that had the longest-term relationship to the U.S. line saga were P.A.S. Franklin and his son John. They were involved in the U.S. line story for 54 years, and the two of them led U.S. lines directly for 35 of those years. J.P. Morgan's stewardship of the International Mercantile Marine transitioned to P.A.S. Franklin on his death in 1913. P.A.S. was an American success story, having started as a shipping clerk in Baltimore and wound up as the chairman of the International Mercantile Marine. In shipping terms, this is called coming up through the hawse pipe. Having come up through the hawse pipe myself, I often wonder if this course is even available to younger generations. Franklin was chairman of IMM from 1916 to 1936. It was considered the dean of American shipping, frequently appearing before Congress and serving as the face of the industry with the press. A search of the New York Times back issues reveals several hundred references to Franklin. On his death in 1939, the Times wrote, For a full generation, Philip Albright Small Franklin was one of the outstanding shipping experts of the world. During World War I, Franklin served as the United States Shipping Board in several positions and controlled about 1,400 United States Shipping Board vessels as well as the allocation of cargo to ports, while at the same time continuing to serve as the chairman of the International Mercantile Marine. The IMM was the largest charterer of USSB ships. It was unlikely that such a situation would be allowed in today's world, but as I pointed out in the previous article, the United States was so devoid of shipping expertise in the years prior to World War I that enlisting the help of executives like Franklin in the war effort was necessary. Franklin and the IMM was not one of the early suitors to operate United States lines in the post-war years. They were, however, aggressive suitors for the Leviathan, as previously discussed. Franklin wanted the Leviathan for the International Mercantile Marine, and it entered into a contract for the United States Shipping Board to recondition and operate the Leviathan at IMM expense after its war duty was done. The IMM and Franklin, however, had a problem in the person of William Randolph Hearst. Hearst was an Anglophile and was deeply suspicious of the IMM's British connections. Although IMM was owned by Americans and managed by Americans, Hearst and his newspapers were able to generate public and political opposition to the assignment of the Leviathan to IMM. Eventually, Franklin had to give up his aspirations for the Leviathan, and the United States Shipping Board took, took on the cost and responsibility of rebuilding the ship subsequently assigning it to United States lines and retaining Gibbs and Cox to supervise the project. It's my view that the assignment of the Leviathan to United States lines was a single event that assured the line's survival through the turbulent post-war period. Franklin did resist the temptation to join the many parties trying to control U.S. lines, but ultimately the United States Shipping Board made Franklin a deal he could not refuse. As described in the previous article, United States lines had been sold to the Chapman Company in 1929, but that sale ultimately failed. The United States Shipping Board took United States lines back in 1931, 
and established a new United States lines registered in Nevada. The IMM by now had given up their foreign operations and had merged with Roosevelt Steamship. The merged company bought United States lines from the shipping board at a significant discount to its book value and made United States lines the flagship of International Mercantile Marine, retaining both Franklin and Kermit Roosevelt on the board. P.A.S. Franklin, in turn, passed the leadership of the company to his son, General John Franklin. John had started his career with Norton Lilly, one of the few maritime companies from the early 20th century that's still in existence. He went on to work with Kermit Roosevelt's Roosevelt Line before joining his father at the IMM in 1931 when Roosevelt and IMM merged. Other than during World War II, John Franklin led the United States lines from 1936 to 1966 during the most prosperous and expansive years in the company's history. His accomplishments included shepherding the planning and construction of the SS United States. Like his father, John served during World War II by heading the Army's Transportation Corps, which brought him the rank of general. Unlike his father, he took a leave of absence from U.S. lines for the duration. John was not as public a figure as his father. The days of shipping executives being in the spotlight had come and gone. But within the United States lines, General Frank Franklin was revered. In 1969 and 70, as a shipping clerk on Pier 76 on North River, New York, I was occasionally allowed to enter the hallowed halls of Number 1 Broadway, the world headquarters of United States lines. It seemed that everyone in 1 Broadway had a respectful story to tell about General Franklin. And last, but by no means least in our story of the people surrounding the founding of U.S. lines, is William Francis Gibbs. <clears throat> A recent edition of Power Ships, number 313, featured an article on the Grace Line and their four sisters of the early 1930s. Seeing a picture of the Santa Rosa, I did not have to read the caption or the article to know who designed the ship. The forward stacks of this 1932 liner had the same winged aerodynamic stack that would grace the SS America, the SS United States, as well as all of the American Challenger-class cargo ships of the United States lines. The ship was, of course, designed by Gibbs and Cox, whose founder, William Francis Gibbs, was one of the most influential people in American shipping for almost half a century. There are not a lot of shipping people who get to grace the cover of Time magazine. His most celebrated vessel, no doubt, is the SS United States, which he designed for United States lines in the early 1950s. But the United States was not Gibbs' first big ship project. William Francis Gibbs and his brother Frederick founded the premier American naval architecture firm of Gibbs Brothers and then Gibbs and Cox. But it was William's vision and his tireless championing of the American merchant marine that sets him apart. We have already recounted the story about how his vision for a thousand foot long ocean liner attracted the attention of J.P. Morgan. That project was derailed by World War I, but Gibbs's big ship vision was refocused then on the Leviathan. First with the International Mercantile Marine and then with the United States Shipping Board, Gibbs was the driving force that brought the Leviathan back to life as the flagship of the American Merchant Marine and the flagship of United States lines. The story of Gibbs's determination and lobbying in this effort is well told in Volume 2 of Frank Brainard's books on the Leviathan. It was Gibbs's fascination with his big ship concept and the Leviathan that made him a player in our story. At the behest of the United States Shipping Board, the Gibbs brothers had supervised all aspects of Leviathan's refurbishment at Newport News Shipyard. Here we see her as she arrived in the yard looking forlorn after several years of layup following her troop transport duties in World War I. The rebuilding effort brought the Gibbs brothers the long-term enmity of P.A.S. Franklin of the International Mercantile Marine, who felt betrayed by the Gibbses, taking the commission to supervise the reconstruction, while technically under contract to IMM to do the same darn thing. The completion of the project did not dampen their interest in the ship, however. William Francis Gibbs wanted to operate the vessel. As recounted previously, the United States Shipping Board had taken the vessel away from the IMM and planned to assign it to the new United States lines, although the U.S. Shipping Board continued to entertain other options at the time. 
Gibbs successfully lobbied the United States Shipping Board to have his company operate the Leviathan for the first voyages in order to oversee the shakedown of the ship's systems. Here he is on the shakedown cruise. That arrangement created the somewhat odd situation of the ship being officially advertised as part of the United States Line's fleet, but actually being contractually operated by Gibbs for what turned out to be the first three voyages. Gibbs attempted to extend the operating contract for the Leviathan, but by now Albert Lasker, the chairman of the United States Shipping Board, and the hand behind the creation of United States Lines and the refurbishment of the Leviathan, had kept his promise to retire at United States Shipping Board head after two years. The incoming chairman, Edward Farley, and his staff decided it was time to turn the vessel over to United States Lines. That event did not end Gibbs' effort to operate the ship, though. Several times during the 1920s, he attempted to acquire the Leviathan by purchasing United States lines or its fleet. The first of these efforts was in October of 1922, even before the Leviathan was put into service. Gibbs entered into a relationship with the Huntington family to purchase the Leviathan, and 12 of the German liners and 7 of the USSB-built 535 liners. The Huntingtons were the family behind Newport News Shipyard. Gibbs went on to mount multiple efforts to buy the Leviathan through purchasing United States lines, with financial support coming primarily from the J.W. Winchester Ship Agency Company of New York. These proposals repeatedly failed because they involved some level of government subsidy. It was probably fortunate for the long-term financial health of Gibbs and Cox that the efforts to purchase U.S. lines did not succeed. In 1929, Gibbs made a further attempt to purchase Leviathan and two other former German liners directly to operate as a weekly service. This effort was preempted by the successful bid from the Paul Chapman Company to take the entire United States lines off the United States Shipping Board's hands. As I recounted previously, that effort failed in short order, and Gibbs' old nemesis, P.A.S. Franklin, reappeared and succeeded in finally privatizing United States Lines in 1931. Gibbs was not done with United States Lines, though. While there were no more efforts by Gibbs to buy the company, the passing of the Franklin generations from P.A.S. Franklin to John Franklin saw Gibbs and Cox emerge as a significant naval architect for the company. As I said, they designed both the iconic United States Lines passenger liners, the America of 1940, in the United States of 1952. In 1969, the first United States Lines vessel I set foot on, the Challenger-class vessel American Charger, was also designed by Gibbs and Cox. I personally think these are the most beautiful freighters ever built. When I joined U.S. Lines in 1969, the company was at the tail end of a 30-ship construction program. By both vessel count and tonnage, U.S. Lines was the largest shipping company in the American fleet. All of the individuals in this story contributed to that success in their own way. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this story with you. I also want to acknowledge the role of the New York Times archives in providing contemporary context and stories for much of this article. Thank you very much.